Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Berkeley Lab Science Series, an opportunity to share hobbies, demonstrations, and innovative research. My name is Faith Dukes, and I manage our K-12 outreach and education programs here at Berkeley Lab. Each of these sessions allows us to explore a particular subject and speak directly to experts that are conducting work here at Berkeley National Laboratory. Before we begin today, I'd like you to set up a small observation with me. You'll need an ice cube. If you have a big one, I have a larger ice cube, you can see. And um, then in a separate container, you'll need um, same volume of water, um, smaller ice cubes. I took one large ice cube and put it in one container so you can see my large ice cube. And then I crushed another, a, a similar ice cube in a small bag. So I have two containers, one with small crushed ice that has a drop of food coloring and then a separate with a larger ice cube that also has um, food coloring. So you can see mine has started to melt, but we will make some observations very soon. Um, Again, my name is Faith Dukes, and welcome to our uh, session today, which will be based on nanoscience. As we begin, I'd like to share some reminders. If you haven't already downloaded loaded it, um, we have an accompanying worksheet, and you can find it on our Berkeley Lab K-12 website, where you can find additional information about the work we do here at Berkeley Lab. Um, the website is going to be posted in our chat box. So hopefully you'll see that there. And then for those of you who have questions, feel free to use the chat box. We're going to use that today to ask you questions, as well as some of our uh, session leads today are bilingual. So you can ask those questions in either English or Spanish. Feel free to submit them in either language. Our agenda today will be going over what is nanoscience? Where can we find examples of nanoscience in nature? Why do we need nanoscience materials and technology? And what are some applications? So for those of you joining us for the first time, um, we are coming from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, or Berkeley Lab for short. It's one of 17 national labs funded by the Department of Energy and the workplace of, as of this week, 14 Nobel laureates. You can see on this map created by symmetry.org, national labs work. Um, we are over here on the West Coast, but there are the 17 throughout the United States. National labs were created to bring researchers together in order to share expertise and sometimes very large and expensive equipment to tackle big problems related to energy. We like to call this team science here at Berkeley Lab. And if you have a chance, you should check out this interactive map at Symmetry Magazine, created to learn a little bit more about each of the national labs. On our next slide, you'll see what we like to call the best view from a laboratory. It's an aerial view of Berkeley Lab site in Berkeley. Uh, we have several sites also in Emeryville, California as well. And we like to call this though from Berkeley Lab the best view from a lab as I just said, and we are sandwiched in between Lawrence Hall of Science and the University of California at Berkeley or UC Berkeley for short. If you're interested in hearing more about the lab, our facilities and research, you can join virtual public tours that are hosted twice a month and we are also going to post uh, the Eventbrite link for you to register for those types of uh, tours in our chat box. So to get into what you are here for today, nano and nanoscience, um, here are a few vocabulary words that we'll be going over. Nano, nanofabrication, nanomaterial, nanotechnology, and nanoparticles. You'll hear a little bit more about each of these words throughout the session, but we wanted to point them out and they are defined on our worksheet just in case you missed them. Again, we are celebrating National Next Nanotechnology Day with our colleagues from the Molecular Foundry here at Berkeley Lab. And the first person who's going to join us is Clarissa Bargoff. Clarissa is a PhD student in material science and engineering at UC Berkeley, and she studies ultra-thin nanoscale electronic materials using the electron microscopes at the Molecular Foundry. She also works with the community communication relations teams there at the Foundry. And Clarissa will be our moderator and asking you, our audience, and our researchers a few questions throughout today's session. Good morning, Clarissa. Good morning, Faith. Thank you. So yeah, as Faith said, I'll be asking you all a lot of questions. I'll be reading out your, some of your answers from the chat box and sharing what you all have to say. So I have a question for you already. My first question is, what is nano? What is nanoscience? Get nano. 
So go ahead, get all warmed up, put some answers in the chat box and I'll share them out with the group. Can anyone tell me what the nano prefix means as a number? So we have someone saying 10 to the power of negative nine. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. So 10 to the power of negative nine means a really small number, right? So one billionth the size of something. Someone else says any materials which having one of its dimensions at 10 to the negative nine. Absolutely right. Great, thank you. So for some feedback on how our audience did and to help us out in today's session, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Lori. Lori leads the communications and outreach efforts for the Molecular Foundry. She has a PhD in geological sciences and she's studied how the Amazon River affects carbon storage in the ocean. She's previously worked on the energy and environmental issues in Washington, DC, and once spent a year teaching oceanography on a sailboat. So Lori, how do we do in our definitions of nano? Uh, I mean, that's a very accurate definition of what is one nanometer, but essentially it's something that's really, really small. And we'll talk about how small as we go throughout the presentation today. Uh, now I'm gonna introduce a space at Berkeley Lab that focuses on nanoscience. Uh, the molecular foundry is what's called a user facility. That means scientists from all over the world come to here to work with our staff and to use our tools. Everything and everyone in our building is focused on nanoscience. Now, nanoscience is not a single field. It's actually short for nanoscale science, which means that within our building, we have biologists, chemists, physicists, engineers, material scientists, microscopists, and more. At the nanoscale, many problems require expertise across multiple fields of science. So instead of going back to school and learning everything they need to solve a problem, our users come here to collaborate with our staff instead. All right, so nanoscience, as we said, is the science of everything really small. And we said that it's one nanometer uh, is 10 to the minus nine meters. But how small is that really? The smallest thing on this slide that we can still see with our eyes is a human hair. But even that is still 1,000 times bigger than things on the nanoscale. That's roughly the same as the fact that you are about 1,000 times bigger than the thickness of your fingernail. So when we talk about nanoscale, we generally mean things that are on the order of like one to 100 nanometers. And so that's on the scale of uh, atoms and molecules, up to things as large as whole viruses. Okay, now I've got a pop quiz for you. What do you think is pictured in the jars shown on the slide? Uh, a poll is gonna appear, and then you can choose what you think is inside. Could be juice, iron, transmission fluid, gold, blood, vinegar, or maybe all of the above. They are different colors. Uh, you can tell us why you picked your choice in the chat box. All right, so hopefully we've got some answers coming in. And once again, if you want to say why you, you chose your choice, feel free to put it into the chat box for us. And once we get enough uh, answers in, we'll close the poll. All right, so poll is done and let's see what everyone thought. Okay, the winning answer is gold with a few people guessing pretty much everything else, including all of the above. Well, the people that guess gold are in fact correct. Uh, these jars are filled with nanoparticles of gold suspended in water. Uh, think of it like having a jar of muddy water. You can't see the individual grains of mud, but that's what makes the water brown. Now, gold as we know and love it, it's a metal, uh, it's yellow, it behaves like a metal, so we can shape it into things like jewelry or wires, and it conducts electricity. So it does such a good job that it's used in a lot of devices to connect different chips and components together. It turns out when you make gold really, really tiny, its properties change. The first obvious change is it, the optical properties. We see it as red instead of yellow. The jars are different shades of red because the nanoparticles in them are different sizes. The other big change is that its electronic properties are different. Instead of being a good conductor of electricity, now it's more of a semiconductor. This is important because if you take a device and you're trying to make it small and all you do is shrink it down, your device probably won't work because the properties of the gold wires connecting everything inside have changed. And so to understand what happened and why, you need to look at things on the nanoscale. 
Now, it can be kind of hard to picture how small the nanoscale is, so I have a video here to help you. Uh, what you're looking at first is the molecular foundry logo drawn with electrons. As it zooms out, notice it disappears and we're left with the Berkeley Lab logo that was drawn with atoms. As it zooms out again, you see it disappears. And now we've used those same atoms to draw a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. And he's drawn to scale where he sits in the Lincoln Memorial. And that happens to be pictured on the back of a penny. As we zoom out again, all you can see is a bright spot where he is. But even this is magnified. Notice as the scientist holds up the penny, you can't see the bright spot at all. So fun fact, Abraham Lincoln is so much bigger than what we normally work on that it took 18 and a half hours to draw, almost a whole day. But even he is too small to see with just your eyes. So this is how small the nanoscale is. It's, it's very small. Wow, thank you, Laurie, so much for that great overview. So quick summary, nanoscience is a science of the very small. It's on a scale of atoms to molecules and I suspect it has tons of applications. So let's take a look at some uh, examples in nature. Um, where can we find examples of nanoscience in nature? Donde podemos encontrar ejemplos de nanociencia en la naturaleza? We would love to hear from you guys for this, so please answer in the chat box. Do you think nature is organized on the nanoscale? We have an answer saying gecko's feet. Yeah, how, how do geckos climb up walls and, and stick to ceilings? And lotus leaf, wow, that's a great uh, foreshadowing from earlier, uh, later today. Yeah, germs and a volcano eruption, very interesting. Yeah, we might see nanoparticulates after a volcano eruption, can change the weather. These are great ideas. Oh, COVID-19, yeah, very, very topical. SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS virus is about 100 or so nanometers across. Yeah. Shark skin, right? So why does shark skin, uh, why does the water roll right off? These are really great ideas. Thank you so much, everyone. If you uh, could think of something in nanoscience uh, in nature, we've got you covered. Laurie is going to share some really great examples of something you might be able to find in your neighborhoods. All right. So now we're going to take a closer look at some plants. Uh, someone mentioned lotus leaf on here, but you can also find nasturtium or some lettuce probably more commonly around your neighborhood or even inside your refrigerator. So let's take a look at two of these and now Faith is going to do some magic to switch over to, um, oops, let me switch over to my other camera here. All right, so she's going to hopefully switch over so you can see this. And now you see I have a nasturtium leaf here on the left and a piece of romaine lettuce on the right. And that was just taken from my refrigerator. The nasturtium I grow in my garden, but it's a very common plant that you see around uh, Berkeley where a lot of people have it in their gardens. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I have this little jar of water that I have colored blue. Here is my jar of water that I have. And so we're gonna see what happens when I put some water onto these leaves. So first we'll start with the lettuce, where here's some droplets of blue water. Hopefully this is catching up, uh, where you can see blue water on the lettuce leaf, where you can see that water droplet has sort of spread out and, I mean, it's doing what water does. It's, it spreads out on a surface, like if you spill a glass of water on a table. And now I'm gonna put some on this nasturtium leaf and we'll see what happens. Ooh, look at that. It has stayed in one place forming one nice little bead of water. All right, so what is going on here? Uh, well, let's take a closer look using a video. And we're gonna have to do some zoom magic once again to switch things around. And okay, there we go. Back to the presentation and now we'll take a closer look using a video. So there's something called the lotus effect, which was first noticed in the leaves of a lotus plant. Uh, so the lotus plant is like the nasturtium in that it's self-cleaning and has this water repellent property that allows water to ball up on the surface of the leaf. Uh, despite constant exposure to dust, dirt, rain, and so on, the leaves of the lotus plant remain dry and clean. 
And that's because the surface of each leaf contains nanometer sized waxy bumps that prevent dirt and water from adhering. Uh, the valleys between those bumps are too small for dirt particles to get into. And so dirt and water stay suspended on top of the bumps. And so as you're watching in this video here, what we're seeing is like zooming in, zooming in, we're seeing those waxy bundles that I mentioned. Okay, now we're getting to 1000 nanometers and now 200 nanometers. That's the smallest that we're going to see here with this electron microscope. Okay. So, all right. One note, Faith, I think you still have my second camera pinned because right now it's just showing my name and I've turned that camera off. Um, <laughs> so now we're looking at some scanning electron microscope images that are still frames that pulled from that video that show the waxy bundles of both the nasturtium leaf and of the uh, lotus leaf. So you can, you can see those bumpy structures. So that uneven structure is what traps air between the water and the leaf and causes dirt and water to just roll off. All right, so new poll question for you. Which of these items uses materials inspired by these plants? Uh, poll should be popping up any minute now. Okay. So which of these items do you think uses a material that was inspired by these plants? You can choose medical devices, nonstick pans, stain resistant fabrics, ski goggles, car windshields, boats, or all of the above. All right. We'll give it a few moments to let people chime in of what they think the correct answer is in this poll. And once we get enough answers in, we will uh, see what the most popular answer is. And drum roll, the most popular answer is all of the above. And that is correct. All of the items in this list utilize technology that was inspired uh, by the lotus leaf effect. And they're, I mean, it's everything from nonstick pans to medical devices and so on. Thanks for that, Laurie. So we have one example of how plants use nanotechnology, but why would we want to use nanotechnology? ¿Por qué queremos usar materiales que son tan pequeñitos? Can you help us answer this question? Everybody, if you read your, uh, can send things in the chat box, I'll be happy to share them with the group. Can you think of any uses for materials that are so small? Why would, you know, why bother engineering at such a tiny scale? Someone says we can create new devices, like in the medical field. Yeah, absolutely. You can have exceptional properties. Nanobots, yeah. To make smaller devices, like a nanoscale cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> Waterproof stuff, yeah. We just gave a lot of examples of you know, self-cleaning or um, you know, water resistance. Food nanotechnology, nano coatings, absolutely save energy and space, clothing, fabric. Yeah, all really great ideas. Thank you for that, everyone. So, okay, cool. Back to you, Laurie. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no idea why my video is not popping up anymore, but anyway, we're gonna take a quick look back at that ice that uh, we had you set up in the beginning and hopefully they'll be showing uh, my camera, my second camera again, which will show the ice that I set up, where you can see that I put the same volume of ice into one big cube and then a bunch of small cubes. This is about three ounces of frozen water. I put a drop of food coloring into each one and uh, I put a drop of food coloring in the glass so you can see how much is actually melted. So uh, what happened here? Do you see a difference in uh, the larger block of ice versus the smaller cubes. So looking at the two cups that I have, we can see that the, there's more water that has so far formed in the uh, glass that has the smaller cubes versus the single large cube. And this is because the surface area of the small cubes is much bigger uh, than the area of the large ones. 
And so we'll magically zoom back to our presentation now to take a look at a picture. So a solid cube of ice that is one centimeter on each side has six square centimeters of surface area. And that's about equal to uh, one, one side of half a stick of gum. But if that same volume was filled with cubes one millimeter on a side, that would be 1,000 millimeter size cubes. And each one has a surface area of six square millimeters. And that adds up to 60 square centimeters. If that cubic centimeter volume is filled with one nanometer size cubes, or 1,000 trillion of them, the total surface area comes to 6,000 square meters. And that's bigger than a football field. So the more surface area you have, the greater amount of material comes into contact with its surroundings, and that can have an effect on what it can do and how well it can do it. Uh, this is why nanomaterials are so interesting to research and can be so powerful in devices. So to learn more about why researchers are studying nano-sized materials, let's meet one of the Foundry staff scientists, Ricardo Ruiz. Ricardo works in the Foundry's nanofabrication facility, where researchers look at techniques for manufacturing devices at the nanoscale. He used to work in industry on creating new methods for making magnetic data storage materials, memory devices like hard drives. Uh, welcome, Ricardo. Thank you, Laurie. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, very, uh, very happy to be here. Uh, for those who speak Spanish, buenos dias. Um, so I have a question for Ricardo. We've already seen some examples of nanoscale science in nature, and we've mentioned a few examples of medicine and electronics. So uh, a question for everyone is, well, we can all think of maybe some examples of really tiny electronic components. So we know that devices are getting smaller every year. A lot of folks think that nanotechnology is only used in electronic materials. So what do you think? Is nanotechnology, Oops. sorry, am I out of order? Yeah, okay. Is nanotechnology only used in electronic materials? Nanotecnología solo se utiliza para materiales electrónicos? ¿Qué piensas? So we already had some really great ideas um, on this topic today. Someone says it is used everywhere. Yeah. It helps us. Okay, so let's um, let's talk a bit um, about uh, where nanotechnology can be used and where we can find uh, examples of it. So uh, people have mentioned uh, about the, the the interesting properties, and we already discussed, and people suggested about interesting properties. We saw that in the example with the gold particles, right? That the colors were not the same as we had in, in, in the bulk uh, uh, of gold. Um, and we saw in the example of ice that the surface area matters a lot. Um, and in reality, uh, nanotechnology nowadays pretty much reaches every aspect of science and technology and touches on many aspects of our daily life. Uh, nanotechnology has grown so much as a discipline that it now uh, uh, it has an impact on areas as diverse as agriculture, medicine, energy, uh, electronics, biotechnology, textiles, uh, and defense and security. Um, and it's so interesting uh, the the applications that people have found um, across across the board. In particular, uh, the topics that we're going to be uh, covering a bit today are going to be related to electronics and uh, biotechnology and how potentially these two could uh, come together in unexpected ways to uh, help us uh, advance uh, our uh, technology and science. Okay, so let's just start with um, uh, the microelectronics and information storage example. And, and just for you to have an idea how far we have come and how much this field has evolved, uh, this picture here on the left shows you the very first hard drive that IBM shipped in 1956. 
uh, you can see how big that was. So it was bigger than a refrigerator and it was so heavy they had to jack it up into an airplane at that time. That massive hard drive could only store a mere five megabytes of data, right? In comparison, um, nowadays uh, we can buy or you can get a, a thumb drive, a USB flash drive that could store a whopping one terabyte of data. Uh, this is how far we've come. Um, and by the way, um, do you have an idea what five megabytes of data is? Um, think about a standard picture from your uh, cell phone. And could you guess how many pictures you could store on that first hard drive shipped by IBM? Um, take your guess and, and uh, please fill on that first question on the quick poll. Um, and by contrast, uh, think about how many pictures you could store on one of those terabyte um, thumb drives. All right, let's take a moment and see what your guesses are. And if you don't see all the options on the second question, you'll probably have to scroll through uh, the available options. Okay, so we have our guesses. Um, the first question, the most popular uh, answer is about two photos and, and that's about right. Uh, a single uh, picture would take anywhere between two and three megabytes of data on a standard cell phone today. Um, so you could only put about two pictures on that big hard drive there. Um, by contrast, um, the, uh, this, the second option, right, uh, would be about, uh, you know, 330,000 photos or so. So uh, it, it is, uh, I recognize it's a bit harder to guess and grasp what a terabyte is, right? Uh, and it is a, uh, um, by comparison, right, a megabyte would be 10 to the uh, power of six bytes, so a million bytes, and a gigabyte would be a billion bytes, and a terabyte would be a trillion bytes, kind of a whopping number. Okay, um, so let's move on and think a little bit about where uh, we do or where scientists do this type of uh, microelectronic devices. Uh, in general, microelectronic devices are fabricated onto silicon wafers on a, a particular type of laboratory we call a clean room. Uh, these are laboratories that have a control atmosphere, a control ambient, if you will. And uh, the silicon wafers are um, these, uh, these round plates made of silicon and then people do the, uh, the patterning and the uh, formation, the fabrication of devices onto those wafers. And for you to have an idea how this looks like, uh, we see there a picture of Clarissa uh, holding one of those silicon wafers. And you notice also that she is wearing a, a particular uh, type of suit, uh, almost like a bunny suit, if you will. Um, any, any guess on why uh, people would be wearing that type of suits in a laboratory like that? Uh, we have a few options for you there on the quick poll. Uh, if you can take your guess, um, let's, uh, let's take a moment. Um, the, the options are because there is a static electricity in the room, uh, because the scientists are using volatile chemicals or because they are meant to protect the science from the researcher or because there's a witness protection for scientists uh, or all of the above. Okay, and the popular answer was that they are meant to protect the science uh, from the scientists. Uh, and, and that is uh, correct. Uh, in, in, in general, a clean room has uh, this uh, special ambient so that there is no contamination going into the samples. Remember, we, uh, we are working with extremely small uh, features and any contamination uh, present or coming off uh, uh, things like clothing, your breath, uh, everything uh, needs to be controlled. So uh, the air is controlling the room, uh, the scientists wear uh, protective uh, um, uh, clothing so that there's no dust or contamination coming 
in contact uh, with the devices that are being researched. Um, all right, um, but as much as uh, much progress as we've been doing on nanotechnology, we are not the only ones that have been using uh, nanotechnology. We've been only using nanotechnology for a few decades now, but uh, in general, um, uh, uh, nature and biology in general have been exploiting what we call nowadays nanotechnology uh, and for, for uh, building structures and for the evolution of uh, biology in general and the evolution of nature. Uh, things like DNA, um, where uh, the information about uh, living organisms is stored, uh, the function of cells and proteins. And as we've seen nowadays uh, in things like virus, viruses as well, right? Uh, these are uh, uh, entities that are only a few uh, um, tens or hundreds of nanometers across. So Ricardo, we've just seen pictures of you know, folks working in a laboratory and we know that you know, we work really hard to control things at the nanoscale, but how does nature know how to do these things? How does it know to create these structures that have specific uh, functions at such a small scale? Yeah, that's an excellent point because clearly uh, nature doesn't have the scientists or the clean rooms to be working and doing their structures. Uh, nature has been able to exploit uh, things at, at the nanoscale by using something we call self-assembly and or self-organization. Great, so let's, let's check that term with the group. Has anyone heard of self-assembly? What is self-assembly? ¿Qué es auto-ensemblaje? So put your answers in the chat box and I'll share it with the group. See if anyone can guess it right. Someone says the ability to arrange themselves. That's actually a pretty succinct answer. So does anyone know how things would arrange themselves? Oh, a great example, um, an Iron Man nano suit. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, if anyone's seen Iron Man, he clicks a button and the pieces go flying onto him. That's, uh, yeah, nature, nature is Iron Man. Raw materials assemble by themselves, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to turn this back over to Lori to tell us a little bit more about self-assembly. Yeah, sure, Clarissa. So like some of the uh, participants have mentioned, like self-assembly means what it sounds like. It refers to the fact that living things can build themselves from their individual starting components. Uh, but let's think of it another way. Uh, say you want to build a piece of furniture. And so you go out to Ikea, you get this box of parts. You have to take those pieces and put them together step by step, which takes a long time and is sometimes really frustrating. And then eventually you end up with your fully assembled final product. Now, self-assembly means that you could take those pieces in the box and sort of like shake them together, throw it into your living room, and then you end up with a fully assembled dining set. And so you're essentially skipping the, this middle part of having to put everything together and it would just put itself together and that'd be magical. Uh, but this is something that all living things can do and researchers are trying to copy this ability. Researchers like Ricardo. That is correct. So as, as Laurie explained, self-assembly is the ability of materials to self-organize into regular patterns without external intervention. And this is a phenomenon that happens mostly uh, at, at the very small scale. And as we pointed out, nature has been exploiting uh, self-assembly to uh, organize uh, more complex organisms. And we as humans, we've been uh, starting to uh, play with self-assembly, if, if you will, um, uh, more, more recently, uh, you know, a few decades ago. And we can find examples of self-assembling materials uh, at the nanoscale in uh, different types of, um, of materials from polymers. And I have here a few pictures for you to uh, have an idea of how they look like. So the one on the left would represent a particular type of uh, polymer, we call a blocopolymer, that makes uh, these very regular 
regularly uh, arrange patterns of either stripes or dots, as you see on those electron microscope images at the bottom. Um, another example would be that of uh, nanoparticles that can also uh, come together into a regular array of patterns as you see those uh, well organized there as well in the in the middle picture. And um, a, a more recent example that came from the Berkeley lab uh, where you see uh, proteins uh, like the ones that assemble at the uh, surface of cells that also organize into regular periodic patterns. And all of these examples are uh, at the nanometer scale, anywhere between you know, 10 to 50 nanometers or so. So um, this is very interesting because uh, now what, what we do in, in research and including at the Molecular Foundry and other places in Berkeley Lab is um, asking ourselves if these self-assembling materials that form patterns that are so regular at the nanometer length scale can be used to actually fabricate uh, useful devices like, like the electronics or microelectronic devices that we were talking before. Uh, of course, one of the clear advantages of that is that it will allow us to keep shrinking uh, and, and increasing the density of devices and, and processes that we can do on, on a single chip or on a single device. And the pictures that are there on that uh, image you see now uh, on the left are, uh, is an example of fabricating uh, magnetic bits for information storage out of a uh, self-assembling template of polymers like the ones I showed in the picture before. Um, in, in the middle uh, image, it's had, uh, another example of fabricating features on silicon like, like the silicon wafers that uh, Clarissa was holding on, the, on a pre prior picture. Um, and the materials that were used to fabricate those silicon lines uh, were self-assembling materials also. Uh, and, and then to the right, uh, there is also an, another example of making an array of uh, magnetic particles out of a self-assembling uh, uh, the nanoparticles into regular arrays that could potentially be used one day uh, for storage. So that's um, you know, part of the uh, exciting research uh, that we and others pursue at, at the foundry currently in trying to harness the effects of self-assembly as nature has done in the past, uh, but now to take it a, a step into uh, making uh, devices that could be used uh, for us in, in our daily lives. Thank you for that overview of your research, Ricardo. So we're actually getting close to the end of our time. So I wanna quickly summarize Nanoscience is the study of very, very small things. Although nature is the original nano engineer, we have a, there's a whole field um, called biomimetics where we just copy what nature is doing and seeing how we can implement it in our own technology. So nanotechnology applications can be found in a broad variety of fields, you know, far beyond electronics. So there's medicine, there's uh, all sorts of surface science, uh, you know, we saw that great slide earlier with a full, full array of applications. So advancements in nanoscience could lead to the creation of new materials, new medicines, new devices, and a lot more. Before you all head out, um, we have a, we'll stay for questions at the end as well. But right now, today, as we said at the beginning of this presentation, is National Nanotechnology Day. And every year, the Molecular Foundry has a nano art competition. So this is real images from science or from simulations uh, related to research that we think are particularly beautiful. And we would love your input if you wanted to vote for your favorite. Um, we could love your help on that. So there should be a link in the chat box to vote for your favorite nano art. Thanks, Clarissa, and thanks, Ricardo and Lori, for telling us about nanoscience. I just wanted to put in that if you're interested in going even smaller on November 20th, we'll be talking about particle detection. So getting even smaller and thinking about um, different types of materials. 
and the scale in which they're on. Um, right now, I'm going to stop sharing our screen and invite our panelists back on, um, Lori Chong, uh, Clarissa Bargov, and Ricardo Ruiz. And you have the opportunity as our audience members for the next 10 minutes or so to ask them any questions that you might have um, come up with um, during the course of these past 40 minutes, 45 minutes while um, they were talking about nanoscience and their research. Um, but the first thing I'll say, I'll ask them, um, as soon as Clarissa comes back on, is uh, what got you interested in um, research in nanoscale science? So, and I'll start that off with Clarissa because. Clarissa, because uh, she was asking our questions today, but we also mentioned that she is currently doing research um, as a graduate student at UC Berkeley and as a scientist here at Berkeley Lab. So Clarissa, what got you into science and especially nanoscience? Well, I think into science in general, I just thought there are so many problems that can be solved if we take uh, you know, a very analytical and scientific approach to it. And nanoscience in particular, I mean, it's just really cool to tell you the honest answer. I took a class in college, um, actually in, in Spain, so nanomateriales, nanomaterials class, which, you know, I learned about carbon nanotubes and all these crazy things we can do at, you know, almost the smallest of scales. So when I started doing uh, research on graphene a few years ago, graphene is a very young material, about 15 years old. So I really felt like, you know, nanoscience was such a cutting edge field or leading edge field. And I wanted to get in on that action. So yeah, I think the physics are really, really fascinating. And I'll follow up with Ricardo and Lauren then to answer what got you into science and then nanoscience in particular. And Laurie, we'll, we'll switch that nanoscience part up for you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I guess uh, it's a, a little bit of a random walk. Uh, um, when I 